today I'm here with the organizers of the Newcastle Coders Group, Peter, Drew, and uh, Clay Thomas. Peter, can you give us a quick overview of who you are? Who are who are sure. the people behind Newcastle Coders Group? Uh, I am a developer. I have been in the area for ooh, since about 2002. Uh, I, prior to that, I was uh, I ran my, a small business up in uh, Tamworth. I came down here looking for more opportunities. Um, I came to really love the area. Uh, moved here with my partner, who I've been together now for coming up to 21 years, which is amazing. Um, the We now have a four-year-old child. Uh, I have worked in a variety of industries. Um, mostly, uh, I seem to switch back and forth between education and employment agencies, but um, writing systems for them. But lately it's been real estate. And I work for a company called BMT. Um, they're quantity surveyors, and they are one of the few people uh, sort of that can actually write a proper forty-year um, schedule for depreciation for an investment property. Um, so they do. They're one of the largest companies that do that. In, I think they are the largest company in Australia that do that job. Um, and you often see them mentioned in places like on the block and things like that. So it's an interesting place to work. I work on their housing house advertising portal, which is called homesales.com.au. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully that's a good plug there. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I've, I've worked for them for the last two and a half years. It's been a whirlwind ride of creating Angular apps and, uh, and um, basically .NET Core backend type stuff and uh, I lead a small team there. Um, we've been really uh, engaged with uh, Angular and Scrum and uh, various new technologies and uh, various frameworks. It's been uh, a very steep learning curve from someone who previously was primarily just a C-sharp developer. Um, but we're all, almost entirely AWS now and yeah, it's, uh, it's a very interesting um, environment place to work. Mate, I think it's actually really good that the people behind an event like this, um, and somebody that's technical, somebody that's been through this, somebody that's actually like one of the attendees going through the same problems. And as you just may mention, hey, you're quite traditionally a C-sharp developer, but has had to evolve with the times and kind of face the same challenges that everyone else. So it's sort of, it's great that there's a practitioner behind it, right? Yeah. Clay, give us a quick overview of who you are, what you're doing. So, um, yeah, moved down to Newcastle from Foster in 2008 because I realized that working in kitchens wasn't going to be a lifelong endeavor for me. It's only about working 10 hour days for shifts and standing up all the time it just didn't really do it for me. So I came down, went through uni and popped out into a little company called Minlog, writing mining software where we did some pretty different things I went through and worked out how do you get a message to a machine that's two kilometers underground and a kilometer away from the closest network connection. So, so working on how to connect those things and solve some really interesting problems and it as I went on, but, so I thought that that wasn't where I wanted to live my life. I always had that bit of an issue with working in mining, coming from a bit of a greeny background and end up um, starting to talk people around and went along to my first coders group, so 2010 and, so I shut the feed and got talking with John Roach, who I was working with, about what I'd like to talk about. And we sat down and gave a talk on the solid principles of co design. And it's sort of formed a bit of a theme in my career, which is always about code quality. It was the guy complaining, we need to write more tests, we need to make better code quality. I don't care that you want to get it out tomorrow, we need to make it good so that it continues to work for years. And that R sort of led me to go into what's NIV. So Work there now in the digital and emerging business delivery department, which is a big mouthful, so we just call it Deb D. Do have people come in, work there for a while, and say, Look, I've been here for six months, I've never met Deb D. Who's Deb D? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, that's us, you're a Deb D. But yeah, so we're working there, working in yeah, the AWS, Node.js, and um, React front ends, and doing some really cool stuff, and in a company that I was a bit surprised when I got there because health insurance is really backwards, not going anywhere, but yeah, we're very technology um, agnostic and pretty keen to get into every new thing coming out and learn what's going on. Very forward thinking company. I'm definitely one of the most forward thinking companies in Newcastle, I think. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you, you, I think you started out with interviewing Matt Finch, who has been driving all that AWS adoption and you know, has been all around the world, so it's spruiking AWS now. So, yeah, I've been there for two and a half years and 
think I've got to keep on there because they're definitely driving my career forward and getting me thinking and giving me the the fodder to go and speak. So I've spoken recently at DDD and a uh, big Microsoft NDC conference and I'm trying to angle my way into more of that again this year. I think it's good for me and good for the Newcastle community to see Newcastle people getting out, getting off these big conferences and saying, Newcastle is just sit back, but we're really a forward moving town. I agree. I think both of you guys are doing a phenomenal job for the community, both like individually and then collectively as with Newcastle Coders Group, uh, to bring an event like this to Newcastle on a consistent basis and to get living. And uh, yeah, living living is a big part. Just yeah. to keep something like this alive for as long as you have, it's been a phenomenal effort. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, boys, can you give us a quick overview of you know, where did Newcastle Coders Group come from? Well, we, we started back in 2005, uh, in December, and uh, it was actually myself and another guy, someone you've actually interviewed previously, which was uh, David Williams. Yeah. Uh, he and I were working together uh, at the time, and we both had an interest in learning more about our craft. Um, so we were traveling down to Sydney at, at odd occasions to go and see speakers down there, and there really wasn't anything here that was like it. So. At some point, we said to each other, you know, there really should be something up here. And we set about creating it. And that was within three days of that conversation, we put on our first event. Yeah. Um, David gave the first talk. He talked about Visual Studio 2005. Um, we set up in the Tessa offices at the time, the company that later became Skilled and it was bought out then again by Humanus, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it's just constantly bought out. But the, that that office out in Cardiff was the first venue. Um, from there, we, we had about 14 people show up yeah. out, of, out of just sending emails around and word of mouth. Uh, and from that, we then basically had our next meeting. We, we got a professional speaker to come up from Microsoft. Nice. Um, uh, he came up from Sydney, and Andrew Coates. Uh, and... We had 60 people turn up <laughs> and from there it just sort of took off for quite a while. We had uh, Adam Koga from SSW, we had Billy Hollis from uh, Redmond in the United States. Uh, we had lots and lots of different speakers over the years um, and it's just been a, a, a bit of a roller coaster, I guess. <laughs> I think 60 people, that'd have to be nearly a record for a local, a local table. It was probably our largest event, <laughs> and I think it was just because it was the novelty of it. Yeah. Um, we settled down to about 40 thereafter, and then we're probably, you know, these days we're around 20, 25, yeah, 30. Yeah, 25, we've got our usual numbers these days. Yeah. 25 on a, it's on a monthly basis, right? Yeah. yeah. It's pretty significant. So there's obviously both of you involved in uh, doing this off your own bat in your own time, how, do, how does how does organising an event like this come together? Well, it's not just us. We do have other yeah. other people helping out. David's still involved occasionally, and John helps out too. Yeah, John Roach from uh, Van Van Law now. He's yep, just uh, helps out and um, just organised our most recent sponsorship. So we uh, lost our major sponsor this year, and then immediately he was able to jump on board. You know, within an hour of saying no, and say, okay, yeah, we'll come in, we'll start paying for pizza. Yeah, we, we, we've been quite fortunate with sponsors and over the years. It's been great. Um, I mean, Microsoft sponsored the pizza initially and that way so people could come and get a free feed, which really for a, for a group like this, a free feed is, is sort of expected almost these days. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, over the, we've had to, to do all sorts of different things to try and keep the group going. Um, they, you know, everyone chips in $5 or, you know, getting individual sponsors or that sort of thing. But keeping sponsors, I guess on board is probably a really key thing. Um, until recently we had BMT, which is where I work, uh, been sponsoring the group. Yeah. And they've been doing that for a couple of years now. Um, they've been uh, sponsoring it for, for uh, I guess, uh, just for the exposure, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, they haven't really asked very much of us in return. It's been a, a quite a good relationship, but um, yeah. That's the necessity for the community events, right, is to have local, local businesses jumping on board yeah. and helping yeah. support that. Not only as sponsors, but also like both your companies, obviously, to give you the time to, you know, time to invest in, in doing this sort of thing. Sure. Well, BMT, I mean, we have a local team, but we're, we have presences in pretty much every city around Australia. So yeah. um, it's it's quite a, a big company. Um, so the fact that they do support local events is, is a terrific thing. Yeah, nice. So you just you just made mention of the pizza before. It gives a quick overview of like, what, if I'm going to turn up to an event, what, what should I expect? 
Uh, so usually we'll um, rock in, start trying to usher people in once they work out how the University of Newcastle works and where the ICT building is. Like it's on top of the car park. And every, pretty much every month, I get a message from some new person saying, where are you? Right? Yeah. Look at the Montessori car park and look up. That's, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we get people in, get them going and settle down. Then usually do like a news thing where we just sort of go around, try and engage people. So one of the things that we love about the Coders Group and that some of our regular speakers love about the Coders Group is it's very interactive. We're not one person sitting up the front just talking to people. It's often people calling out and sometimes getting a little bit rolled up. But yeah. So we start with news, trying to facilitate that, set up that environment. So it's, hey, we want you to talk back to the speaker, talk back to us and get things going. So cover off whatever's happened recently in technology. Every month a new JavaScript framework is coming out, so you can always find something to talk about. Then, yeah, we kick off with the speaker, but then run for, really try and give them as much scope as they want. So we've had some talks go for five minutes, and we've had Adam Cogan come and talk for three hours solid. Yeah, right. Right yeah, talk to of a horse out there. <laughs> yeah, he just goes, because he's using us as a testing ground for his things. So he goes, does this talk. About an hour in, we stop. I'll, I'll just uh, interrupt you. The, uh, when he says testing ground, he means uh, Adam will present at big yeah. events down in Sydney or Melbourne, yeah. and we'll probably often get on like a, a, Sydney, a, a, a precursor or a preview of the whole thing. Yeah, very nice. Also, yeah. London, Redmond, he talks yeah. at the, um, the international um, keynote Microsoft events. So he's bringing those talks that he's going to speak at with for, you know, to thousands of people. Yeah, and exactly. sitting in a room with 20 people and saying, what do you like, what don't you like? I'm going to give you the three hour version and I'm going to cut out two of those hours. So if you ever wonder what doesn't go into a talk, we've got all that <laughs> stuff as well. <laughs> but it does mean that you learn a lot more than you will just to the a straight up um, conference. Yeah, so about an hour into that, we stop, have pizza, try and get everybody talking. Right? There's that bonding thing that happens over the food that humans you know, revert back to, you know, lizard brain or whatever you want to call it. Start sitting there, have a chat, and then if we've got more talks to go, either a second speaker or Adam's still going, well, <laughs> yeah, we'll bring them in, um, have everybody come back, sit down, have a talk. And at the end, thanks slightly to our sponsor, Safi. So you invited um, Cameron Owen, his yeah. company, he gives a bit of money. We've been able to go out and buy some prizes to give away to the people to turn up. And, nice. Yeah, just lucky draw prize, and yeah, then we send everybody on their way. Right now, so what's a what's a length? What's the standard length of? Uh, it, it's generally uh, in the vicinity of two and a bit hours, um, yeah. but but it can be people can stick around afterwards. Sometimes they yeah. stay till nine or so. Yeah. It's usually six till whenever we finish up. But, Perfect. And but people can leave at any time, of course. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're many. not locked in. <laughs> Mate, there's probably two elements that I found really interesting. So the conversational aspect of it, right? Especially with coders groups, right? I guess if you had to say coders or developers by nature are probably more introverted. So I think that conversational part, you know, helps break down that. And so I think for the challenge to try to get to people to these type of events is, is to break that down to say people that it is a conversational type thing. You're not going to have to go there and sit by yourself in a corner. Yeah. I, th I think that may once have been true. Yeah. Um, some of the people you meet now, uh, they are quite happy to talk <laughs> and they're actually very, uh, very accomplished people themselves in areas other than just programming. And you can actually find a lot of people who are, you know, interested in extreme sports and all this sort of thing. And yeah. they really break the mold of what is traditionally seen as a developer. Yeah. Um, they're really, the, the scene has changed so much in the last 10 years. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, in terms of the group, yeah, we definitely don't have people sitting off on their own. You'll find that a lot of people come in. You know, if they don't know anyone, they'll quickly know somebody because with that news thing, everyone's sort of got a bit of an idea what's going on. It's also a good way to get people talking to each other. And other than that, we've just got a really friendly crowd. They often see people come in, they don't know anyone, and they'll sit down next to someone and say, oh yeah, what's going on? And start just shoot the ship with them. Yeah, nice. Right then you get, a, you get a few core people uh, who yeah. turn up at every meeting, but in general, people just come to the meetings they're interested in. Yeah, so right. you'll see different groups of people coming at different talks. And that's one of the things we've always sort of been very broad in our scope. We're not focused on on JavaScript or various other um, particular frameworks or anything like that, as some of the other groups have, have been. Yeah. So we have, we have a bit of scope to, to try different things and 
um, from time to time, just you know, throwing strange talks that maybe even that, that yeah. maybe we didn't, you wouldn't expect. But we we cover methodologies, so type of how, how people develop. We talk about um, uh, specific frameworks. Um, we talk about databases. We talk about um, you know, SharePoint or various other platforms that have that have come and gone <laughs> over the years. Yeah. Um, we've seen. Various technologies rise and fall in that time. Uh, it's been what nearly we're in our fourteenth year now. Yeah, fourteenth year now. So, so yeah, well, we've had yeah, soft skills talks as well. So if you're on agile, but we had one talk that I was a bit worried was going to not be successful at all. Where John and I had organised our HR lady from work to come and talk about HR and IT. Yeah, I don't know. We had two talks, and you see everyone was there for the second talk, and she got up first, and started talking about things, and as she went along, he was like, yeah, "Hang on a second. You, know, you can negotiate that. Oh, I didn't realize that I couldn't be fired for that, and these sort of things. And it ended up being this talk that we had to be pretty so engaged because you know, everybody's worried about their job at some point. Yeah, yeah. And some of our talks have been yeah, so extreme soft skills, uh, soft skills, extreme uh, hard skills, and everything in between. But yeah. it does sound like it's definitely an opportunity if somebody's got a question to ask that they yeah. can come to an event and they, they've got you know a problem. I can come and talk to people about There's it. a peer group there, yeah, that yeah. they definitely can um, ask questions of. And, and most people are pretty direct. They'll tell you what they think. And it, we try to foster an atmosphere of openness and, and not, you know, not exclusivity at all. Um, I think that's really important. Uh, key element of not being exclusive is um, we're perhaps the only group that doesn't meet in a pub. Yeah. We've been at the university and Peter's very good on this. Peter, I'll try to say, we should get to a pub. Everybody likes beer, we should get to a pub. No, when I was young, I went to the Linux user group, computer user group, wherever it was. <laughs> it would have been the Apple user group, the Aubrey Wodonga Apple user group back in the 1984 or 5. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so we had people under 18 coming on to our meetups. We had a, one guy, Alex Edwards, who, admittedly, he's, he's a gun, he's, he's brilliant, but he's come along, he's just finished interning at Atlassian, he's doing these things, but I'm sure why it started because he didn't come along and start learning about software development when he's in high school. Yeah. Had another kid who was only 15 turn up, meet up recently. So we try to make sure it's open so anyone who does want to come along can come along. So it's someone who was 11 just the other day. Oh, 11 was it? Yeah. I'm oh, really bad telling you how old people are. Sort of he came with his <laughs> father. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, um, uh, there, there have been a few parents who brought their kids along um, just by virtue of the fact that they were concerned and then over a, a few years just gone, okay, yeah, just hang on for that. Hang on, hang out there because it's safe. But yeah. Yeah, I can remember Alex first came because that was there and not looking overly interested in like, what was going on. And yeah, by the end, you'd see Alex at the end sit down there and so and go, All right, Dad, come pick me up. Yeah. Went on for the night. Obviously if you if you're doing a, a talk about how something can be used in business context, they're probably that, that talk is probably of less interest than say an IoT talk, yeah. which we have had both. Perfect. <laughs> the second part, the second part that interests me before is the speakers, right? You've talked about people that have spoken at international conferences yeah. and I, I'm aware that you've got other speakers, as you said, that speak for five minutes, somebody probably speaking for their first time publicly to other people, right? How, how do you go about putting a speaker program together? Because once a month, every month is a phenomenal effort. Well, we, we tend to attend events separately and whenever we do, we go and hassle people who are speaking at those events. Um, and that's that's a common thing. We just basically get in their face and, and say, you know, hey, we have this group up there. Um, one thing we uh, we were very lucky with early on was that uh, we were talking to Microsoft. They, they wanted us to sort of be part of the user group family. We decided we wanted to be agnostic. And they were, they were fairly respectful of that, um, but they were still prepared to send speakers along and talk to people who might have really been interested in Linux or other 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 technologies. Um, so we did get access to a lot of their speakers, um, and there is actually, like they actually put funding towards some of their evangelists, as they call them. Um, so you can, you can access those types of networks, um, which we have over the years. Um, people like uh, Andrew Coates or um, Richard, is that David Glover. David Glover. Uh, my apologies. Um, and I guess, and people like uh, Adam Kogan, he, he actually is um, a representative of Microsoft in the sense that he's the Microsoft regional director, one of I think three or four in Australia. And once a year, they, all four of them go off to the United States and they find out about what the strategic direction of Microsoft is. And they're very heavily involved. Um, so they have a 
they have funding that is actually devoted towards coming and talking at events like this. Um, finding Linux speakers is a bit harder, or finding people from other things. Usually they're, they're hobbyists or they're passionate or they're, they have some kind of um, drive to actually talk about this stuff. So we, we, that's a different approach. You're sort of more hands-on. You have to really try and encourage them a lot and yeah. a lot of communication and basically getting them over the line. Oh, you, I can help you with that speech or I can you know, maybe listen to it and see where I can give you some tips. Or, yeah. So there, there's, a, there's a process of just massaging these sorts of things to happen. And I was talking to uh, Ronan Dehas last night who runs the new... Uh, blockchain Newcastle uh, yeah. event that's only had four meetings so far, um, and he was saying that when when he can't find a speaker, he's going to have to do it himself. <laughs> and I think we've we've that's, both done that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, one month where I was talking before I even organised. I think he was talking about like, oh, have you ever done one of these? And he's like, oh, I have. That's how, that's going to be our talk on Wednesday now. I was like, Monday, <laughs> <laughs> Wednesday, Pete <laughs> pulls out a talk and it's like, yeah. I'm, Here's this thing that Clayton tried to ask me about on Monday, so <laughs> I'm going to talk about it now. But yeah, it's it's hard sometimes getting this big lineup organised, and sometimes you get really lucky. You get a guy like Rowan, I just called out on Twitter yeah. um, a couple weeks ago. I said, look, we're looking to set things up, and we jumped on there. Or we had uh, Damien Brady, who's another international Microsoft speaker. Yeah. His wife got a job at John Hunter, so I moved to Newcastle. And you know, that's just fortunate for us. <laughs> it's oh, always easy to turn yeah. up. But, we had um, one, probably one of my favourite talks ever was um, uh, Brad McGee, uh, who was a he's, he was at the time one of the most respected um, DBAs in the world. Um, and he worked for a company called Redgate, and he, he just happened to be coming to Australia. And I was on a mailing list that heard about it, and I just emailed the guy who was organising it, and I said, "Any chance that you can get Newcastle to be a stop?" And after a bit of to and fro, he agreed. And, and, he turned up like someone funded his hotel room yeah. for the night and he came and gave a talk to about 30 people right. and it was fantastic I mean, you know we got to see an advanced talk on how to use the sql profile yeah. which um you know you would pay a lot of money to go and attend a proper right. <laughs> uh, event for but um he, he gave the talk for free of, uh, of his own accord basically that's brilliant yeah. yeah so finding speakers often it's just a lot of reaching out on whatever social media you've got whether it's emailing lists or being famous or, yeah <laughs> Yeah, belligerent, I like it. Like just <laughs> walking up to people and saying, hi, I saw you gave a talk. Do you want to give it again? <laughs> so sometimes that's local people, sometimes it's international, sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not. We've had bad talks as well. You know. Had some talks where people turn up and they're really just there to try and sell their consulting services. I think we've all been one of them in the past. Yeah, and it's a bit disappointing when that sort of thing happens. But I think, I think over the years it's happening less. I, I think people have woken up to that. The, uh, even the people giving the talks, just it's pointless. Right? Oh yeah, I think so. I think, so. I think it's, it's become well known that you know people can see straight through it and see what people are there for. Um, and hey, there is a way to sell to people by actually providing value, right? If you got somebody that's there, and yeah, they might have a business interest in at heart, but they're there, they provide you value. That's a that's a much better sell than them trying to flog you a product. Absolutely, um, that's one thing Microsoft are doing well with their. On the developer evangelist roles, but also the regional directors and MVP program. It's all those two are completely unpaid, and it's just them rewarding people for going out in the community and showing just people how to use the Microsoft product. So Adam Kogan doesn't get paid to be a regional director, but he just yes and no what's coming up. It's to be important. Yeah, it's just because he goes out and he speaks to these things like Newcastle Coders Group and it provides value to the community, and that then helps Microsoft sell over right in the end. Yeah, we've we've had some we've really had some great presenters over the years, yeah. um, not just people from international uh, events. We've had people from Redify and SSW come up, various other companies. Um, Paul from Queensland used to come down all the time. So, oh, Paul Usher. Yeah. Usher. You had Paul Stovall from um, what would become Octopus Deploy. Uh, yeah, Paul Stovall uh, used to be a regular at, at our talk. I, don't, I haven't spoken to him in a few years now, but I, I should probably hit him up and see if I can get him to give another talk about Octopus. But actually, we were at a. He, he was at an event here, and he raised. He asked the question of the room: "What does everyone think about a deployment option that would get you to deploy software, but it would be like NuGet?" And everyone sort of thought, "Yeah, that's a good idea. That's his company." Yeah. <laughs> 
But what's he, successful for other people, right? As you said before, it's a sounding board. It's a sounding board for people and they can either test their, their ideas or they can test their, their speaks or other people that have just got a question that can become, hey, they're uh, going to most, most of the time be, not be the most intelligent person in the room, right? And you yeah. know, that conversation learn from other people. Absolutely. I think that's the most important part of like networking events, right? It's that ability to network and learn from other people. So I think you mentioned before, another event, right? Four, five, four events hold, the blockchain event at the moment. You guys have been running for longer than anyone in the tech scene in Newcastle? Uh, when we started, there was a, a group, Linux user group, the Linux user group in Newcastle, uh, mm-hmm. Linux owners group in Newcastle. I should get that right. It's Bill's login. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and they were, they, were, they were the only thing around at the time. And I went to a few of their meetings and um, it just wasn't quite the same. It was more of a meetup and peer yeah. exchange type of arrangement. No, less sort of, they'd occasionally have speakers and so forth, but um, they, I think, still, uh, I think they sort of morphed into the makerspace type of arrangement, okay. so they're still around. My question was going to be along the lines of, you guys have been doing it, obviously successful, to, to be around for as long as you have, because I don't think anyone could question that, because it would be dead if it wasn't successful. What advice would you give to other people that are looking to, to start meetups or um, or to continue to grow on their, their meetups? Oh, I'd say regularity is probably key. That's Consistency, uh, yeah. definitely. What the Giles Committee have done this year, and going to see every second month is so much better than cancelling even every third meeting or every fourth meeting. This, this, every time I've had to cancel a meeting, we see our numbers drop off immediately. Yeah. That regularity starts to put it in the calendar and say, yeah, well, First Wednesday every month, I'm going to go to the Codis group, or I'm going to at least book out the time to go to the Codis group even if I decide not to go. Yeah. That and get a sponsor. Yeah. It's crazy like, how much difference asking someone to pay $5 for pizza versus you know, everybody in that room is probably reasonably well paid. They're not, yeah. not angling $5, but as soon as you hear that free pizza, yeah. that number's probably doubled. Yeah, I think that's a convenience thing as much as yeah. anything, right? And it's just like you can come there and it's a, you, you know what you're going to get. You, yeah. You're going to be fed. You're going to take home some information and it just becomes yeah. easier. It's an easier sell to people to come along, right? Sure. Yeah. So if people are looking to sponsor, reach out to you guys or yeah. you, you, you reach out to feel free. Yeah, <laughs> get it on cell phone, meet up, or if you know us another way, or at NCGAU on Twitter. I'm always pretty quick to answer anyone who's on there. Nice. What I've been keen for as well is just some information. Like you've obviously been around Newcastle Tech Scene for a while. Um, I'm relatively new. I've been in Newcastle Tech Scene for four and a half years now. You guys have got a couple of years on me. Um, what's your thoughts on the, the evolution of the Newcastle Tech Scene over that time? When I when I first arrived in Newcastle, I came from Tamworth, yeah. and I'd been running my own business there. Um, I had worked for pretty much all the major clients around that area and they'd run out of work effectively. So I came to Newcastle and it was a st- it was definitely a step up, but there weren't that many programming jobs. And I, there, there was definitely a vibe that people were leaving Sydney and coming up the coast. Um, so they were coming up towards Newcastle. And it was sort of a feeling that, that you had a lot of people entering the scene after the fact of BHP going. So there were there was a lot of interest in finding a new industry that, that people could actually you know, folk conglomerate around, I guess. Um, and I guess over the time, I mean, there was, a, there was a concept that if you wanted to have something done or developed, you would go to Sydney at the time. You didn't have, you didn't have the, the overseas sort of offshoring happen yet. That was this back in about 2005, but it wasn't far off. But you did have uh, a concept that no, nothing could be developed in, in Newcastle. And I think that is completely 180. It, it is just a complete change. Uh, we have so many talented people locally now. Um, we have we have been involved with the university who provide us with the space to meet uh, uh, on a monthly basis, and that's so important. But they also have put the onus back onto us, and we've participated in various things with the uni, particularly myself. I'm on the advisory board of the, of the um, IT department, which basically as an industry representative so that they, I can say to them, you know, I don't think that meets the needs of the industry. And, yeah. and they, they reach out to various organisations now. Yeah. And with that level of engagement, I think what's happened over the time is that the community has get, sort of fed the people that are coming out of the uni and the uni, the uni has fed the local scene as people are staying instead of heading off. 
to, to the big smoke um, and they're effectively created an industry really out of out, out a very strong service industry locally. Yeah. So it's been a, a really good upward trajectory the whole time we've been here. Um, so I haven't been around the industry for anywhere near as long as Pete. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I came out of Union in 2008, but in that time, the biggest shift I reckon I've seen is from everything being mining. When I came out of uni, everything in Newcastle was mining, mining related with a couple of banks in health insurance tucked on the side. And now it just seems to have shifted completely. Mining is a side industry for like from a technical point of view that is. And uh, we see consultancies, agencies, all these other tech scene just all of a sudden lost in it. So it's saying it, we've fed the ground, it's starting to grow and now everything's starting to shoot up. Newcastle's a pretty exciting place to be from a tech point of view at the moment. Yeah. I can only expect it's going to grow. So you've been 10 years out of university yeah. in Newcastle. How's, how have you seen the change in landscape from an individual perspective in opportunities? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, was, yeah it was mining to start with and then mining downturn obviously hit but just after that and things went a bit, a bit sideways for a year there. Yeah, since then it's increased a lot. Definitely the opportunities and say the breadth of opportunities. Mining's, and people mining software isn't a very forward thinking industry. They're very hesitant to change and you know, they're based on something that's been going on for you know, thousands of years. Digging stuff out of the ground and burning it, basically. And yeah, whereas you know, the beauty industries, the um, agencies coming up, you've know, got like, new, newism and mud bath and something's kind of providing much more landscape to build other software products here in Newcastle. There's startup industries just gone crazy the last couple of years, you know, the smart cities and all those sort of things really pushing forward and it's just yeah, opportunities go all now where they just play okay. recently. Yeah, I think we've been very fortunate locally. We have a sort of a reasonable standard of living um, without, the, there's always been a perception that you didn't have to necessarily have as, as quite a larger pay in order to have the same quality of life down in Sydney. Yeah. Um, whereas when the offshoring sort of period happened, which was an issue for a few years there, um, probably around 2010, um, I think that there was a perception that everything was going to leave Australia, but it didn't really leave Newcastle. <laughs> um, there were still things happening here, uh, and that was really interesting. Whereas Sydney probably suffered a lot more. So we've been we've been able to weather a lot of the um, the upturns and the downturns. It sort of it just seems to be fairly consistent here. Um, what I find really interesting about the Newcastle scene is that uh, the people really do seem to like living around here and they really do have a passion for the area so it's not as um maybe it's not quite as mercenary this sort of idea that you always get the cheapest maybe you actually want to have the relationship with the person that you're employing um, so it's an interesting employment market as an industry to work in yeah, the other thing that's really started to happen recently is the the rise of the remote worker We're seeing more and more people based on Newcastle to enjoy that quality of living the center of living but working either part-time or completely remote from Sydney and People working for Alaskan, Heroku, and you know, other American companies as well, where they're based out here so they can live here, they're working from home with you know, faster internet speeds and everything going on. Really well, not, not just remote work, but, but with the faster internet speeds, it means that if the data center's in Sydney, you don't have to have the development team in Sydney to, to do the work. And AWS and so forth, being able to create virtual servers and all these other sorts of, um, that, I guess, cloud companies that, are, that have sprung up mean that it really doesn't matter where you are. Um, being in Newcastle or Sydney or Melbourne, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So it's it's been, I think it's really worked in Newcastle's favor over the years. I completely agree. From the two points that you did mention, uh, the people that are born and bred in Newcastle who love the area and won't want to move away. So I think there's, there's a big part of that, but there are also the people that, as you said, who may have grown up here, gone, moved away, but then went, went really starting to attract some time back to Newcastle, who have maybe done some time in Sydney or done some time internationally, and are coming back, looking to settle down with the family um, and coming back to Newcastle. And there's plenty of opportunity these days for those type of people as well. You guys have both been to a, a bunch of national events in the past, and we've had to travel to Sydney in the past to go to events to see speakers. And what do you think the, the benefits of having something like this in Newcastle for people to attend very easily on a monthly basis is? I, I guess there are benefits to the people themselves. Um, we, we, you get the chance to learn things that you wouldn't necessarily uh, have access to in your local area. Otherwise, you'd be limited to actually watching it on a video. Um, and with, it, with the video, then you aren't 
able to interact, you're unable to ask questions, maybe you, you might have an impersonal relationship with the forum, but being able to meet the person who actually is, is the person behind this particular framework is a real advantage. So we try to get experts in the field and they can often provide insight that isn't available in a, in a context of something online. They can pr provide experience and, and uh, examples of things that they've used. Uh, right down to, on occasion, uh, I mean, a company that I, the company I work for recently hired a speaker from from the, the group because they were wanting to actually do something that he was an expert in, and it, it it really comes down to there are so many advantages to having the the people in Newcastle and being able to interact with them directly rather than have have them somewhere far away where it's. Maybe you've got a connection over the internet, but what does that mean to, to a person? It doesn't mean much. It means much more that they recognise you, that they hear you, they've heard your voice, and that they can actually talk to you. So yeah, we really do help people build connections, both you know, with the speakers and within the group as well, as led to people getting jobs and sort of thing. But yeah, just that ability to know that other people are feeling the same pain that you are, and. That's what we get. So sometimes we have the specialty speakers that you know what they're talking about really well. But sometimes we just have, say, me getting up and saying, "So last week I had a crack at this thing, and I hit all these roadblocks." And just knowing that other people in the community are feeling the same thing as you're feeling really does help to like bring the community together and yeah, share that pain and sometimes solve them. I will say that. Uh there is a vibe that you get on the night with when you've got a group of people together and you're talking about something that's really an exciting new technology that you don't get if you're just looking at something online. You can get people get quite passionate about technology and, and, and advances and things that are happening. And that can really translate into a really exciting experience. Um, but also if you are a regular attender of the Coders group and you've, you maybe give, come a few times and we've asked, maybe you could put a talk together about something that you maybe want to uh, present about, or maybe that you've got a bit of experience in, uh, that actually can lead to opportunities in itself. So being able to say, hey, I'm someone who goes to the reg and participates in the community regularly, I go and attend these meetings and I'm actually an advocate for this type of stuff, uh, that opens doors that maybe wouldn't open otherwise. I could not agree more. I obviously sit on the employer side of things and helping companies in, you know, hire, hire talent. and. Having people that are genuinely interested in this in their own time, going and attending events, but they also go to a point of speaking at events, it just shows it shows another level of interest and shows another level of commitment and passion about what you're doing. And hey, passion's a big part of this, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you, we have people who are um, employers attending these events as well. I, I went for my interview at NIV, I walked in, and the guy sitting on the side of the table had seen me speakers. I sat down immediately. We knew each other's names. You start, you start at a point it's a long way forward from walking into a room with a bunch of strangers. I completely agree. I can, couldn't agree more for people that, hey, if you are looking for opportunities or you know, yeah. willing to interact or want to interact with other people within the community, uh, an event like this would, would obviously be beneficial. And when we get down to specifics at the end of the day, why should people attend Newcastle Coders Group? Well, when, when we've sort of talked about the rise of the Newcastle industry, and I guess tech industry over the last 10, 15 years, um, I don't think those things happen in isolation. It's people participating in the community. It's people basically putting themselves out there and, do, and doing things that actually makes things happen locally. Um, so I guess by participating, you're actually helping yourself, you're helping the people around you, you're helping your friends and your, your, your community actually rises as a result of participation. Basically creating an, an environment where there's more opportunity and going forward, I think that that's really why you should be attending these things. Um, it just helps everyone and it lifts the boat. Um, I'm someone who has basically come along at a time when, when things were, there wasn't really a lot happening, but there really is a lot happening now. And whether you come to our group or another group, it's really important, I think, that people enjoy, like come to something that they're interested in and, and do, do what they can to participate. Yeah, I completely agree. So if we, if we are talking about somebody participating, where are they coming? When are they coming? So we're first Wednesday of every month at 6 p.m. Uh, kick off the, the news section, 6 p.m. The talk about 6.30. 
and then if people need to leave early, they're welcome to. And if they do arrive late, it's not going to be a big deal. Uh, we're in the ICT building, which is on top of the multi-story car park at the Callahan campus of the University of Newcastle. And we're usually in room 34, but if we need to get shined out, we'll have somebody in the foyer directing people where to go. Cool, and it's an all-age event? All-ages event, so if you can walk, you're welcome to turn up. And <laughs> you know, if you can't, you're also welcome to turn up. <laughs> and, and pizza are available. Yeah, no, if pizza are available, if you've got dietary requirements, we'll make sure we cater for it. As long as Domino's can cater for it. <laughs> Sounds very inclusive. Uh, you can get us on Meetup. So we're Newcastle Co's group on Meetup. We're at ncg.asn.au. So ASN stands for association because we're an association and we want to be good net citizens, <laughs> even though nobody else uses the ASN domain name. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we're on Twitter at, at ncgau. You need to get in contact with us because you want to speak, you want to attend, or you want to sponsor. Just grab us on any of those forums, we'll get back to you. Week. We'll link that all up in the show notes as well yeah. on the new Tech People website. So, hey, hopefully, people can get in touch with you. Hopefully, we can increase the attendance and uh, continue the success of the Newcastle Coders Group. Yeah, let's we'll continue the success of the Newcastle development community in general, really. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, man. Cheers. <laughs>